You're watching The Buck Stops here and it's time now to introduce our newsmaker tonight. We know him as a member of parliament, but he is also, of course, a prolific writer. He's been a diplomat and he seems to be able to write books at an astonishingly fast and productive speed. He's out with his latest book, An Era of Darkness, that looks at colonialism and its consequences on India and whether Britain, in fact, owes reparations to India for its colonization of our people, a book that actually originated in a address that Shashi Tharoor made at Oxford University that subsequently went viral. Shashi Tharoor is with us. That was, of course, a very, very memorable speech. But Thank it's you. rare for a speech uh, to actually lead to a full-length full length book. I agree with you. It was quite an astonishing uh, development when my publishers called me and said, look, you've got to do a book out of this. And I said, wait a minute. Um, doesn't everyone know this? And he said, no, everyone doesn't know it because if they did, your speech wouldn't have gone viral. So I did discover that I, I, I somehow, simply because I had read a great deal and from my student days about all this, had put together a set of arguments that suddenly opened the eyes of many people. And putting it in book form, I thought would be relatively easy. Boy, was I wrong, because um, it's one thing to deliver a 15-minute speech. It's quite another to write a solid 300-page book with all the solid research, facts cross-checked and double-checked and footnoted, and that uh, took me a little While being a full-time politician. While being a full-time politician, writing opinion pieces on current events in the, in the, in the media and on the internet, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But yes, I mean, the thing is that this was, a, was something that impassioned me. We'll come to the book in a moment that. from now, but when you did make the speech, it invited high praise from the Prime Minister, from the usual critics of the Congress. I remember uh, author Tavleen Singh, who, who is otherwise a trenchant critic of the Gandhis, you know, applauding you. Prime Minister Modi's praise raised eyebrows. More than once, this kind of thing creates whispers that Shashi Tharoor is going to one day be closer to the BJP than he is to the Congress. No, actually, this particular issue is one that unites all political persuasions in our country. Mm. I dare say, because I was chatting with Sita Ram Yechuri, that the CPM would have no problem with this book because it makes an argument about the nature of India's exploitation by the British that left and right should be able to concur upon. So mm. I don't really think that this would be a book on which to hang such a theory. Though well, I realize that politics comes into everything in our country, even into history. Well, that theory does persist, and more on that later. But in the preface of the book, you actually talk about how you're still waiting for a, a, a leader of Britain that will come and, and actually go down on her or his knees at the Jallianwala Bagh and at least apologize. And you believe that the comments that have come from previous leaders like David Cameron have been mealy mouth to yep. borrow your phrase. I think so. And I'm conscious, of course, that the book happens to come out just before the British Prime Minister. I was going to point Theresa that out. May actually lands up in Delhi. But the truth is... Would you expect that, her, uh, you no, expect her well, to come here and apologize? Probably not. It is her first visit and, and they've got to know each other and, and discuss isu other issues as yeah. well. But I feel that the right time for her uh, to do so, or for any British Prime Minister to do so, should at least be the centenary of the Jallianwala Bagh massacre. Uh, I cannot think of a, a better example of everything that was wrong with the Raj, the brutality, the unprovoked violence against unarmed people, the needless, almost psychopathic killings, uh, and the way in which Indians were treated before and after the killings as well, uh, which I've described in some mm. detail in the book. I think this is the moment uh, for uh, someone, I hope it's Theresa May, to go to Jallianwala Bagh, sink to her knees and ask for forgiveness. Uh, not because she did anything wrong or her government or anybody in the last 50 or 60 years mm. has done any harm to India, but simply in the same spirit that the Prime Minister of Canada, Justin Trudeau, apologized to the people of India uh, for the way in which his forebears, as it were, had behaved on the Komagata Maru mm. incident because the uh, people, mainly Sikhs, who were turned away on Komagata Maru, many of them, a good high percentage of them, a majority of them, died as a result. Of but there's an irony in what you're saying because you're hoping that she might be the leader to do this, but she's actually in a post-Brexit Britain uh, making it difficult for Indian, uh, Indians to even become immigrants in Britain. So, you know, where is the reconciliation between the two positions? Reparations on the one hand and a post-Brexit Britain? Well, reparations I specifically don't ask for because I've pointed out Well, you asked for a symbolic one a sim pound. A symbolic one pound I asked for yes. in my speech. In the book, I say that even that may not be practicable. Mm. And, you know, I, my argument is that any amount 
that is just would not be payable yes. in any amount. And it would be more than Britain's GDP. Payable would in not fact, be yes. just exactly. Yes. So, so I think even uh, uh, even the one pound that is payable would probably not be practicable between the two treasuries. The cost of administering such a payment would be onerous. But an apology actually doesn't cost them anything and at the same time does goes a tremendous way towards healing. Mm -hmm. I think that um, just as the Komagato Maru apology was made, it would be a good thing to apologize on that basis. I don't expect it in the first meeting immediately mm. after Brexit, the first visit to India, the first dialogue with Prime Minister Modi, etc. So I'm not expecting it on this visit, and I'm not expecting anything like it on this visit. One of the other arguments you make in the book is that this political system that we in fact have inherited from the British is in fact ill-suited for India, namely the parliamentary democracy yeah. system. You argue for a presidential form of government. It may never come. It may just be an abstract, academic, self-indulgent Shashi Tharoor argument. I'm afraid so. <laughs> but, but, to, but to push you deeper on it, our politics is already so Americanized. It's already so d driven by the cult of personality, by narrative versus narrative, spin versus spin, the amplification of noise on social media. Do we really need for a country as complex and diverse as ours, a further personality, cult-oriented, driven system like the presidential system? Well, that's precisely why we need it, because we already are like that. Yes. You know, if you want to vote in Delhi, you vote for or against Kejriwal, not for Ahmadmi. Mm. If you want to vote in Tamil Nadu, you vote because you want Jaya Lalitha to be chief minister or not, or Mamta in Bengal, or the Thakres in, in Bombay, or, or, or YSR Reddy's son in Andhra Pradesh, and so on and so forth. We are already distorting a parliamentary system by voting for individuals. So is ideology so getting less and less relevant? Where has it been relevant, Barkha? Look at our parties. They all have interchangeable ideologies. People skip parties, split parties, change labels, create S gutbandans, break them. I mean, so the, the irony... Congress and the BJP are just shades of each no, other? No. Congress and the BJP represent a significant difference, and the communists as well. But they're, but they're too. There have just been shades, right? As you said, people migrate. Rita Bahuguna Joshi can say one thing one day, say another. Sanjay Nirupam, who was with the Sena, is now with the Congress. Rita, who was a trenchant critic of the BJP, is now with the BJP. And also you have this perception that, that, that you know, for political purposes, ideologies are bent, right? So yeah. you have Shah Bano's blot in the secularism debate around the Congress, you have the Rushdi blot on the free speech debate, and you have similar arguments for the BJP. So would you be so honest as to say that ideology is not the driving force of party politics in India? Well, my argument is a little more complicated than that. Uh, yes, I, I would agree that ideology has not been significant enough, unfortunately. But equally, I argue that our system, unfortunately privileges inefficiency. We've seen for 25 years, when you create coalition governments, they're immediately hostage to the lowest common denominator. Mm -hmm. The weakest link in your government can threaten to bring you down over any issue it doesn't agree with, and the net result is that you are held up mm -hmm. in terms of any efficient action. A prime minister in a coalition government or a minority government inevitably spends more time and energy maintaining his or her majority and staying mm -hmm. in power than in using that power for the benefit of the Indian masses. Sem similarly, at all levels, it's not just the Prime Minister. I want the same in the states, I want it in the cities. Why don't we have directly elected mayors who are actually accountable for everything from potholes in the roads to garbage collection? But to don't we have to start with the CWC of the Congress, which hasn't seen an election in I don't know how many years? Well, you know, at least in the Congress, we don't doubt who our leaders are. I mean, we know who the President is, we know who the Vice President is. In a mayor, do you know who, in your city, do you know who's really accountable for your problems? There's a mayor who's a glorified chairman of an election, of, of, of a municipal committee. There's a committee which itself has no real power and on top of that there's a municipal commissioner who seems to exercise control over the budget and of the system. It's a, it's a mess and it's actually both privileging inefficiency and undermining democratic so, accountability. So, in this so directly elected leaders would serve that. But directly elected leaders, if it were ever to happen, and as you say, we're already so personality oriented, is that the main liability for the Congress today? The fact that uh, Narendra Modi has been able to create uh, a, a narrative that is very much around him. It is in fact, 2014 was Modi's victory much more than the BJP's victory, and very much the defeat of the Gandhis, if you will, than the Congress party, some could argue. By extending your own argument, and that is in fact what the Congress is struggling with today. See, but that, that personality isn't striking a chord. Baka, you raised the theoretical debate, which I have actually been making for 25 so years the, before anyone yes. had heard of Narendra yes. Modi. So, so let me say that my argument is independent of personalities, and after all, there will also be a post Narendra Modi in this country. Mm. So we can't reduce institutional questions to one individual. Having said that, as far as Mr. Modi's style of governance is concerned, we have 
reason to suggest that it's a problem because we have to judge the system as it is. We have a system of cabinet government. But is the cabinet full of people who are empowered or is it full of people who have to refer to the prime minister for every decision? Yes. We speak of a uh, prime minister being a primus inter pares in a council of ministers. Yet it seems that every minister's files are being headed off to the PMO for decision making. Mm. As a result, there has been a great slowdown in the speed with which decisions are taken, even the speed with which appointments are made, because there's a limit to how many things can be done by one PMO's office in, in a country mm. this size. So very clearly, in the case of the system that we're trying to run now, which is a parliamentary system, the prime minister's centralization of authority hasn't worked and isn't working in terms of delivering And yet a results. presidential form of, of government, which you argue for in, in an abstract, would be different, absolutely. Would centralize power even more? It would centralize power, but be balanced by equally powerful chief ministers in the states or governors, because we won't need both, and in the, in the city level. So they'd be empowered, accountable, elected individuals everywhere. Now but now we've gone on a complete no, tangent so let's, from let's the come back to the Let's come back to the yeah. book. Your book actually traces back two of our most archaic laws yeah. to the colonial years. Absolutely. The criminalization of homosexuality and the sedition laws. Absolutely. Both of which you have tried at an individual level uh, to, to change in parliament with little success, right? The fact is that, you know, today the Congress speaks of, and the Congress does speak of, of decriminalizing homosexuality, but 10 years in power, your party didn't do anything. You well, had the opportunity to, and it just passed the buck onto the court. Actually, we didn't have the opportunity, Barker. To begin with, when the Delhi High Court ruled that 377 was essentially unconstitutional, the Congress government could have appealed the decision, which is indeed what mm. the legal bureaucracy wanted to do. We chose not to, mm. because the effect of that decision was to render, render 377 inoperative. Mm. So we didn't need to scrap it. Mm. It just disappeared. Mm. When the Supreme Court then ruled in December... But if in, I remember, December, two ministries had different points of yeah. view in the court, and they didn't there speak are, in there one voice There are other things, so but yeah. in fact, in the end, we didn't, didn't appeal. The, we could have taken the mm. appeal to the Supreme Court. We chose not to, yeah. and I'm glad we chose not to. In December 2013, when the Supreme Court ruled, I can assure you that many in the Congress spoke against the unfortunate implications of that ruling, and that included the president of our party, Sonia Gandhi, and myself, but there was only one two-week session of Parliament purely to pass the vote on account of the budget between the Supreme Court decision and the imposition of the Code of Conduct. So it was not possible to introduce I'm just saying, other than yourself, you haven't seen the Congress actually raising this as an issue. Well, I Parliament. can assure you that when I did my private member's bill, especially after the first attempt unexpectedly failed at introducing mm -hmm. it, for the second attempt, Mrs. Gandhi, the Congress president, and Rahul Gandhi, the vice president, at an internal meeting of Congress, MPs publicly expressed their support for my bill. So the party leadership has no problem with what I'm doing on this. At the same time, it's very clear that as long as the BJP has the kind of crushing majority it has, this is not going to work unless they change their mind. And that's why after my second well, attempt... Well, the BJP also has leaders like Arun Jaitley who've asked for a Well, he doesn't unfortunately seem to have done anything about it because it's his own party that mounted an organized effort. And I mean organized. You don't get 74 MPs on a Friday afternoon mm. sitting on the BJP benches. Go and look any other Friday afternoon during private members' bills. This was a deliberate effort to sabotage this particular bill. And if the party, if powerful leaders in the party had wanted to prevent it, there's very little evidence that they tried. So my thing is they need to sort out their internal views. But if they do come to a different position, great. It would be better for the country. If they do, because as I've argued, this is not about sex. But it's see, about freedom. I and agree. our freedums that we fought for, uh, the, part, the government, the ruling party has done nothing I, to I, I agree, but it seems to me that all of parliament uh, in many of these cases actually passes the buck uh, to the court. One of the more interesting revelations that hasn't come in this book, but I do have to ask you about it as we close, uh, is your revelation that when you actually made a bid uh, to be Secretary General of the United Nations, it was not China, as was widely believed, that stopped your candidacy, but actually the United States of America. You quote uh, the memoirs of a, major, uh, of a senior American ambassador and a conversation with Condi Rice. Can you shed more light on that? Well, uh, yeah, it turns out in, 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 in a memoir that I must say I would describe as disloyal to reveal mm. such indiscreet instructions, uh, the then U.S. ambassador to, to the U.N., John Bolton, says that he was told by the Secretary of State, we don't want a strong Secretary General. Uh, that's not very flattering to the Secretary General, whom they did support. So it's, it's unfortunate that he did that, because once the man is elected, I think everyone should have kept quiet on this. But anyway, he's now coming to the end of his term, and I thought I can finally speak out openly. I did hear from a number of American officials. There were some features uh, which I've analyzed and explained in my article. One was that um, 
they didn't perhaps get the impression this was as much of a priority to India, mm. which was busy pursuing the Indo-US nuclear, nuclear deal, deal at yes. the same time, uh, as it was to Korea, which, which they had so many other problems with mm. uh, President Rumi Hun that, uh, mm. that they, no May Mu Hun, mm. that they couldn't actually end up um, adding one more irritant if they could possibly help it. A second issue was indeed um, the, the uh, perception that a secretary general who might be able to appeal above the heads of governments, as Kofi Annan had done, uh, and speak to the world media and so on, was not in the U.S. And they saw you as that kind of threat? As, they as saw as you a Kofi Annan-esque <laughs> figure? I, I, I guess so, because I, I, was, I was on uh, the world media a lot in those days for the U.N., and they could see that the potential danger of that, which is what they were concerned about when Kofi made his famous statement to the BBC that the Iraq war was illegal, that made him thoroughly unpopular in certain neocon circles in Washington, I think they could see that that was going to be not to their taste. And so they made it very clear that, uh, that those factors weighed very heavily with them, plus, of course, uh, Mr. Bolton's revelation as to what kind of candidate they wanted. At the end of the day, it was they, there's no doubt about it, who voted against me. There's only one permanent member who cast a negative vote, that was the U.S. Pleasure to have you on the program. Thank Looking you, Thank you for reading your book. Good Thank to you. be with you.